Thank you. Um, but before I start, if there's if there's a, a multitude of roaring noises in the background, I'm not being assailed by sea monsters. I just have two small children just come in the door from school who seem to be decided that today is the day to behave like sea monsters. So um, that that might be they they would probably come in in a minute. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to say really thank you to Deanna for setting the scene with um, everything that has has happened in the last. Oh, what is it, 12, 13, 14 years or so. Um, and I'm going to try and pick up on a few of those things um, inevitably uh, in, in kind of giving you a bit of an oversight of what the Commission is aiming to do in the next um, sort of period of the research framework. Um, so what I'm going to kind of go through today is a brief bit of context, which happily can be very brief because Deanna's um, outlined much of um, what exists within the Commission in terms of what we're attempting to do um, within and for Wales as maritime archaeological record, uh, and just the extent of some of those, some of that, some of that material within the um, within within the NMRW. Uh, a little bit of a review of two projects in particular: the U-boat project and the Cherish project, um, for which I've picked for reasons. So the third bit, which is to sort of present. Um, where I think we're kind of seeing the, um, the, the Commission's research agenda over the next um, four or five years, that kind of thing, which is very much picking up on those themes that Deanna mentioned, thinking about the marine planning system and the need to inform that as best we can, um, but also in such a way that it underpins the wider research um, that, is, that is generally happening. And to sort of give you a, an outline of a, a five-year, maybe a 10-year plan, um, of, of where this might go. So in terms of the Commission, um, very much a remit to contribute to and enhance the maritime element of the National Monuments Record of Wales. Now this is a, a really, um, I think, comprehensive thing in many ways in terms of being able to locate sites uh, and to get across that, that baseline information that has, that has been there and been put in place over the last nearly two decades. Um, Importantly as well, though, is fulfilling the Commission's role as the statutory consultee for marine license applications within Wales. So this thing that Deanna talked about, that, which is becoming, I think, an increasingly joined up thing um, and increasingly driving what happens, actually, the, the marine license system, which is, is pretty much there for everything that has to be done now from um, coastal development, offshore wind farms, the things people always think of, cable laying, uh, but even the replacement of small seawalls, a bit of re-sanding on a beach, um, bridge replacement works along some of the coastal railways and so on. So that's <clears throat> becoming an increasingly important part of um, my work at the Commission uh, and something that takes up um, yeah, more, not so much more and more time but it, it just becomes a, a bigger thing I think. But within that obviously we have a remit to disseminate and engage the public with what we're doing <clears throat> which will not come as a surprise to people, but then also to develop new, better, improved ways to, to kind of do everything, actually, and, and to do all this. Now, those records that we have within the Commission um, at a national level, as, as those of you who will, who will have looked at the draft chapter, um, have some understanding of, of what's in there around the sort of, yeah, 32,000 kilometres of Welsh Sea, um, two and a half thousand odd kilometres of coastline, that number varies quite a lot depending on um, <laughs> which instantly available internet source you look up. Uh, and, and amongst that, there's oh, something like 1,500 kilometres of coast path, uh, which is readily accessible to the public and, and I think has a, a big potential engagement um, factor there, particularly with the intertidal zone. And, and what this gives rise to is around 8,000 or so entries that I think you can see is sort of sitting below and beyond the high water mark, or those grey dots um, on the map, which range hugely, as Deanna said, from you know anchorages and seascapes and some slightly more conceptual things through to you know shipwreck sites, submerged forests, and so on. These, yeah, many many of these sites, you know, well over half of them are things that we don't know where they are. We know they they're there somewhere. They've been lost. They're documented wrecks. And then we have the much more tangible things like the aircraft crash sites, fish traps, um, things like lighthouses, submerged forests. There's a few stepping stones in there. 
Um, there's a wreck on the screen there that's down at Goodick in Fishguard uh, on the foreshore there. There is also the kind of the interface between the land and the sea, um, which is an important part of the framework. Um, ports, harbors, docks, landing places. And I think it's, um, you know, it's a really important feature of the National Monuments Record and our understanding of maritime activity that these are these are mapped, but and also it includes yeah, things that where there's not really a, a hard, you know, structure thing, an anchorage um, or a roadstead, these kind of things. And the, and the projects that have happened to, to kind of put those in place, I think are really, really important and shouldn't be overlooked. And then I think we can go a little bit beyond that sort of high water mark and look at the, the coastal margin as it's termed in some sort of management speak. Um, and the sites of a maritime character that are sort of just a little way inland um, lime kilns, promontory ports, industrial sites, um, you know, the, these kind of things are all part of the, the sort of the maritime facade, if you like, of the Welsh coast that we need to be considering as we as we go along. So so that's the kind of the, the extent and the breadth of the material um, that is in there. And and to demonstrate this to quite how phenomenal the Apapa is, is that in, independently, we've both chosen some of Mike's multi-beam pictures of it uh, to put in our in our presentations, um, which which brings me on to a couple of the things that have been sort of running and were wrapped up, if you like, a little bit in the in the last sort of period of the research framework. Firstly, the U-boat project, um, which Ian may talk about a little, in a little while, and Mike as well, which I think really demonstrates the power of stories about people um, on these vessels around the Welsh coast. <clears throat> and demonstrates the power of some of the 20th century material, which I think is sometimes overlooked in the public eye. You know, people wonder and marvel at the Newport ship and the Ireland's farm vessel and some of the submerged landscapes and things like that, and rightly so because of their antiquity. But also we can, you know, we can overlook a little bit the, the ability to weave together the, um, you know, the, the sites on the seabed, the historical material, the artifacts, the personal connections that people have. Um, so I think the U-boat project has been, you know, considerably notable for, for doing that and leaving behind this legacy of this um, collection of material that's there in the website and in the People's Collection Wales pages uh, for, you know, people to continue to discover and look at. And, and the, the weaving together of all those different source materials is something that I'm going to come back to uh, in a little while when I talk about the Unpath Waters project. Secondly, then on to the, the Cherish project, um, which has played a huge part in directing what the Commission has been doing in the last few years. Um, Cherish has now completed the first phase of its work, uh, which is the sort of the, the predominantly fieldwork phase and has moved on because the project has been extended slightly by 18 months or so because of the, because of the pandemic. Uh, and because of the sort of a, a little bit of extra both time to replace that lost time and some of the funding that was in place because of that, a bit complicated, um, but is running till I think it's next summer now, all in all, um, but is really starting to move to a phase of producing the goods, if you like. Um, first of the things that's going to come out this summer is a series of practice guides for utilising that, that marvellous toolkit that was on one of Deanna's slides for for all of the different methods of interrogating the archaeological material along the coast, uh, the intertidal zone and into the into the marine zone. Um, and I think it's it's a it's a set of practice guides that's not necessarily aimed at um, you know professional organizations perhaps, but but is going to be hugely beneficial to you know the likes of NAS volunteers, um, community groups in giving them a framework to hang some of their activity on. And a, just a document to go to and think, well, we've got this site, we're working on it, it'd be nice to do some work on it, what is the best way to, to go about doing that? Um, so that should be in place by, um, I think, August or September is when that is being aimed at. Um, and I think also Cherish has really identified the, you know, has, has sort of made a mark, if you like, in terms of being able to, to demonstrate the usefulness of of looking at climate change and particularly coastal change on a series of sites. And I think our challenge over the next five to 10 years is to start to replicate the interrogation of individual sites across 
you know all of the multitude of the the dots that we can that we can see on our you know GISs that we can you know summon up at the the touch of a button. So to move then on to um, how I've kind of started thinking about the direction that the the commission can take over the next well sort of five years, but I suppose twenty twenty six is the next um, iteration of the research framework and what has kind of come to me over the you know the last six months or so is that is that really what we need to be doing is really driven by the the marine planning remit on the one hand but very much interlinked into the challenges um, and issues caused by climate change on the other the the marine development is you know as i'm sure everyone's aware increasing on a yearly basis around the welsh coast both in scale scope frequency importance um very you know, lots of this is linked into climate change, either in a proactive way, such as, you know, re marine renewable energy schemes. We're all used to, um, you know, fixed offshore wind farms off the North Wales coast in particular, but there's a whole battery of, um, literally a battery in some cases, um, floating offshore wind that's been developed off the Pembrokeshire coast, tidal energy schemes going in in the Milford Haven waterway and up in other places up in North Wales, um, Bardsey Sound and the like. So, this work is going to develop, you know, more and more and more over time. Um, the, the things that have gone in 10, 15 years ago are going to need decommissioning at some point. And then on the other hand, I suppose, is the reactive um, work, the mitigation for sea level rise, storminess, floods, coastal defence schemes, all of these things. And, and I think taken together, these are the factors that are likely to have the biggest impact on um, to use a, you know, a the management speak heritage assets, not a nice phrase, um, I don't think. It loses a lot of the, um, I think, the value really to society of these things, that phrase. But, but it, you know, it gets across what they, what they are in the eyes of the marine planning system. Um, and underpinning all this really has to be um, just improving our baseline knowledge. Um, not to say that it's bad, just that there's always the opportunity to make it better. And that, I think, is what from the Commission's point of view, fitting in with our remit, we should be aiming to do because it allows effective monitoring of these sites. It helps inform the significance of them and understand them. It facilitates much better planning decisions. Um, and fundamentally, for what we're here today to do, uh, it underpins all of the ongoing research that is taking place around the coast. And I think I sort of see this as taking place in three ways, really. Um, the the sort of the targeted desk-based research and analysis that um, you know takes place in the winter when it's dark and windy and generally disgusting outside. Um, the field survey that the Commission does, um, but also recognising that this is a resource that should be able to be enjoyed by everyone and members of the public, and not just in reading about it, but actually going and engaging with it and recording it and measuring it and contributing in that way. Um, and frankly, there's not enough of us within Wales doing maritime archaeology to cover all of the sites anyway. So, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, um, I think, requirement for, for public contribution, basically, if we are going to sort of achieve what it seems we need to achieve. Um, so to, to bring in then the Unpathed Waters project, um, this is a, a sort of, you've probably read about this in some way, but a, a UK wide multi organisational collaboration. Um, I'm not sure anybody involved quite knows how it's going to finish, um, but it has a sort of a set of objectives at the beginning. Um, so within Wales, it includes the Commission, uh, Mike up in Bangor. We're working with colleagues from uh, all across the rest of the UK, up in Scotland, University of Ulster, University of Southampton, English Heritage, National Maritimes Museum, and so on. And, and what it's really seeking to do is to join up all of those records, um, and maritime records that exist, so that it would be possible in due course to take a you know a wreck site similar to let's say the Apapa um, or another one and and not have to scrabble around thinking well I wonder if there's a Lloyd register survey of the ship and I wonder if there's a crew list in Liverpool Maritime Museum and I wonder if there's a survey I can find somewhere but actually to have all of those things sort of at your fingertips to begin with to to generally improve all of that um, at the same time it has huge potential to improve the rest of our records in Wales. Um, there's going to be a, a machine learning um, AI element to it, which is going to interrogate the National Monuments record and try and sort of 
fill in fields in a in a joined up way that maybe aren't there at the moment and to link those into other places like the Lloyd's Register or the National Maritime Museum um, to hopefully to you know improve our understanding of lots and lots of the different data sets um, the Mac even whisper it quietly result in a standardized sort of craft type thesaurus for the whole of the UK um, rather than the sort of slightly different ones but almost the same um, ones that we have at the moment so some of this work involves things like correlating um, national monuments, our national primary record numbers to UK KHO IDs, um, working out where the gaps are in this sort of the offshore system, something I've talked to Mike about a bit, and we've got a sort of an ambition to, you know, maybe there's funding that can be undertaken to, to, to fill that last sort of 15 to 20% of the wrecks that we know are there that, you know, could really benefit from one of his multi-beam surveys across them. So there's these kind of things, both from the desk-based work that we can do all around the, you know, the maritime elements of the National Monuments Record to, to improve things. There is, of course, the field survey itself um, that we can do. So this is one of uh, Toby Driver's aerial photos of Goodick uh, taken at the beginning of March 2022, when in, a, in an extreme piece of joined up um, archaeological fieldwork, he was flying over Goodick Sands at the same time that I was on Goodick Sands. Um, which meant that we were, yeah, literally almost doing the same thing at the same time. But we have this tremendous baseline um, from the aerial photography within the National Monuments Record. But it's also possible to go into that and find sites. There's a there's a shipwreck just to the north of the or the south actually of the the big fish trap that you can see on the on the side there that wasn't in the Monuments Record. Um, so that's the one that's on the top right of your screen there, circled in orange. Um, that we were able to go and visit and ascertain and add into the, the NMR, but also to start trying out a few different techniques, in this case, marine geophysical survey on test sites or intertidal geophysical survey, as I should say, using terrestrial methods in the intertidal zone, just to really test them out and understand if they're feasible, applicable, um, you know, what the usefulness might be on sites where we know there is stuff. Um, and we've done this on two, three sites down in um, Pembrokeshire at uh, White Sands uh, and down at Albion Sands with a range of different sort of um, knownness, if you like, of the shipwreck resources there. And the other thing, and it, and it definitely is a useful thing to do, um, I won't tell you if you've got a Dutch flute on your beach or an East Indiaman or a World War II destroyer, um, but it'll certainly tell you where there are things and where there are not things. Um, and all of this is, is yeah, potentially useful for, you know, marine planning mitigation and the like as well. Um, and then finally into the, the sort of the public com contribution side. Um, I'm very aware Ian is going to talk to us later on, um, potentially, you know, without wishing to second guess some of the NES material. Um, the, there's the, the desk-based work that can feed into that earlier thing that I was talking about with things like the Welsh Rec Research Project, which has been phenomenally successful in improving our knowledge of a huge range of sites in Cardigan Bay. Uh, and has left me with plenty of work to do to yeah, update our records in turn. Um, but also things like the, the Wales Coast Explorer uh, phone app, which was launched in April, along with uh, in conjunction with Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum and a few others, that has a, um, a cultural heritage, archaeological aspect to it. So aiming to really integrate our maritime cultural heritage into things that are really um, were originally designed to promote uh, and engage people with the natural world. So it has a huge selection of um, archaeological sites, but also critically the ability for people to report what they can see on the beach and to take photos of it with a location on it and to just, you know, hopefully fairly easily say, well, there's this thing is here that I've never seen before. Um, somebody should know about it. Because I think, that, as we all know, the public are, you know, hugely um, informed and 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 happy to inform us where things are and yeah that that is what is needed to kind of um build on the on the on the success of what's happened previously and to try and increase our knowledge of these sites and to discover the new ones and there are still sites there you know those those eight thousand records are not the be all and the end all of the maritime archaeological resource in wales um there are new things being discovered all the time so in terms of a, um, a sort of a five or 10 year plan, um, really about more detail, I think from my perspective, um, I think we have a really good understanding of what's where 
um, and it's just about filling in additional detail of what's actually there on the ground. Um, and in an ideal world, that is to go out and laser scan, photogrammetry survey, whatever it might be, the most appropriate method, all of these sites, which sounds like a mad idea uh, in some sense, because there's a lot of sites. But actually, I think it's something we should be ambitious about doing um, and we can probably achieve it over the next, um, I'd like to say five years, maybe 10 years. Um, so yeah, come back in 20, 2032 um, to see where we're at with that. And But I think really because it enhances our ability to hit the marine planning objectives, climate change, but it just improves the fundamental record that we have to um, record things and for people to research them. Okay, obviously we're gonna have 